Hey everybody, happy Friday. Welcome back to a coffee chat. <sighs> January is in full force. <laughs> oh my goodness, what a crazy week for so many reasons, but we are going to keep things positive here on our coffee chat. We're going to do some fun stuff today. Hey, Lillian. Hey, Susan. Hey, Christabel. So we are going to um, talk about some of the basics of tarot because as we have gone through the various lives and coffee chats, I get a lot of questions about tarot and like, how do I get started? And I'm seeing a lot of questions about that in the coven as well, um, which is so awesome because so many people are interested interested in where do you get started? How do you get to know? And I know that, you know, it's 78 cards and that can feel really overwhelming. Like, what do I do with them? How do I read them? Do I have to memorize everything? Where do I start? Which deck do I get? There can be a lot of questions. And I am by no means a master of tarot, but I have taken a full year of lessons. So I do know more than I did in the past. And I work with my tarot cards every single day. So this is going to be fun. And I'll give you some tips for how to read your tarot better, what kind of deck you should buy, and just some basic tips. I think that'll be really fun to do. And um, I have on my phone pulled up the uh, questions from the chat in the coven today. So thank you for posting that. I think you posted it yesterday, Christabel. Thank you so much for posting that for us yesterday. It has been a busy week for me because I have been finishing up the Fate Surrender novel. So many of you know and have already pre-ordered, but Fate Surrender will be out next Friday. And the book has really come together so well. <laughs> there is a... Um, not an ending to the series. So there is a dreaded cliffhanger at the end of this book, and we will just leave it at that. No spoilers coming, but it is a really good ending, and I think it's really fun. And there will be yet another book coming in this series. And I don't even want to say that the next book will be the final book, because as this has shown me now, um, you know, originally the Shadow Demon Saga was also meant to be a trilogy. Vivian, oh my gosh, hi, hi, hello, hello. Um, yes, the uh, the Shadow Demon Saga was meant to be a trilogy as well. And by the time I made it to book two, I knew that it was gonna be a much bigger story. And here we are <laughs> 10 years later with like 16 novels in the world and more to come. So yeah, I, I'm hoping for my own sanity that this will be the last book coming up, but I don't even have a name yet for what will be the fourth book. <laughs> Christabel, did anyone not expect a cliffhanger? <sighs> I actually just asked um, Jennifer Evelyn Hayes, if you guys remember, um, I think I have them around here. Um, she had made, I showed you guys before, Jennifer had uh, sent me some fun stickers that she had made for her uh, Redbubble store called Winkle Lark. And they're so cute, like really cool stickers for writers. I actually just put one on my new plotting journal, but I asked her I, kind of jokingly on Instagram <laughs> to put, uh, to make me a sticker that says warning cliffhangers ahead. And she made the cutest sticker. So Jennifer, I have not responded to yet, but I love it. We'll have to talk because I would love to get it in my Sarah Cannon colors, like purples, because orange is probably my like least favorite color of all time. Um, <laughs> don't you mean a Sarah hanger? Yes, per George. Um, so I will be in touch with you. I can't believe you did that, but I absolutely loved it. And I was smiling all day after seeing that you made that. So very cool. Um, but yeah, there's, I, every time there's a next book in a series, there's going to be some kind of cliffhanger because that's just how we do and it makes it fun and hopefully you know the only problem with them is then how long does it take to get to the next book so we're going to talk a little bit about <laughs> game plan for the rest of the year I think we kind of discussed it a little bit last week um oh yay I almost made it in purple teal and pink yes do it do it do it um so I have a couple of different things, but I think it will be super fun to talk about tarot today as well. So lots of fun stuff we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and answer a couple questions from the coven because there weren't a ton and several of them have been asked before, but obviously people can't be at every single live to hear them. So I might go over some stuff you've heard before a little bit. 
But um, T Moana was asking if I'll open birthday mail on a live. So yeah, absolutely. If I get any birthday mails coming up over the next couple of weeks, I will definitely love to open them live. I still have been kind of slowly going through all the letters in the big photo album that you guys sent to me. Thank you again for that. And it's just been like this week was a good week to turn to some of those things when I was having a little bit of stress. It was like, okay, I am going to um, you know, open up another letter and it just really has made me happy to have a place to put all of that. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, if I get some more mail for my birthday, I will definitely open it on a live. That would be awesome. Debbie had asked with the witch's door near its release, have you considered ordering some to be signed and sold to your fans? Like you did with the witch's key. I bought four for my sisters who all loved the signed books. Yes. So the witch's door, I still don't have a complete date for the start date, but it should be coming up here before the end of January. We will do a start date and I will announce it hopefully by next weekend when we're going to do a start date for the witch's door. So once that starts, we'll start going to Monday, Wednesday readings and keep our Friday coffee chats is kind of how it is planning to be in terms of what our timing will be. That will put the actual release date of the book probably into March. So I'll read it during the end of January and throughout the months of February and March. And then when I kind of um, know, I'll probably put the book up for pre-order everywhere I can. Right now, because of pushing Fate Surrender back, I have lost pre-order privileges at Amazon. But everybody keeps telling me that if I email them and tell them I would like my pre-orders back, that they will give it to me. So if I am able to, I will put it up for pre-order everywhere, probably for towards the end of March. And that will be, I won't be able to put the paperback on pre-order, but I will put the ebook on pre-order. When we get close to the book is actually finished and um, the paperbacks are coming out and everything else, which I'm anticipating to be March, late March, then I will definitely do another signed book signing. The difference will be, however, that we are going to use the new covers. So I probably will also open up a chance for people to order the witch's key in paperback as well with the new covers. So if you didn't get a chance to order the witch's key with the original cover, um, if you didn't hear <laughs> um, the news, I announced this kind of towards uh, the end of the spooktacular, but I am the witch's key cover. I loved that cover, but it was a pre-made cover. So it was not tr my traditional style by my cover artist. So I have new covers that will be coming out when the witch's door goes up for sale as well. So there'll be new covers going on to that series. And when that happens, the paperbacks will all switch to being the new cover rather than the original cover. So when that happens, I will give you guys a chance to, um, to order those from me as well with signed copies. I in terms of signed copies for Beautiful Demons, because they're still over here on my desk, I have been signing them throughout the week, but I haven't actually sent any out. It was really fun to see that uh, so many of you have been getting your free postcards. And I know they're just postcards, so like they're going through the mail. I didn't put them in envelopes just to keep the price down uh, because it's like 20 cents cheaper to send a postcard than a letter. So I know some of them got a little bit uh, dinged up in the mail, but that gives it character. <laughs> if yours got totally squished and like, like totally destroyed and you can't read the signature or whatever, I'll be happy to send you another one. But I think most people's just ha maybe had a little bit of damage, which I think is fine. Um, but I will give you guys a chance to do more orders later. But I will, um, I do have probably, I think about 20 copies of the witch's key with the original cover that I'll be giving away. And, you know, maybe putting up for order if anybody wants the old cover. And I will announce to you guys before I switch the covers over for anybody who still wants to order that original cover. And then after that, they will all switch to the new covers. And I will give you guys a chance to order either books one and two, if you didn't get the original, or if you just want a second copy of The Witch's Key with the new cover um, and the new book. So that will all be coming in March, which is going to be awesome. Um, so Christy had asked, what is your favorite childhood book and did it inspire you to become a writer and or inspire your own books? So we have talked about this a few times before that one of the first books that really sparked my imagination was 
the secret of NIM or Mrs. Frisbee and the rats of NIM. That did not inspire any of my work necessarily, but I just, it inspired me in terms of understanding for the first time that a book could kind of magically transport you out of your everyday life into a fantastical scenario, like identifying with rats, like who would have ever thought that was a thing that you could do. <laughs> but yet there it was. And I was just so transfixed by that. And I was probably maybe seven or eight years old when that happened. So that was inspiring in terms of a book that made me realize there was a whole world inside of books. But in terms of my favorite books or authors that I really got involved in to the point that it made me want to be a writer, Christopher Pike was that person for me. And I, I know that many of you also were Christopher Pike fans. Back in the, the day when I was a teenager, there really was not a huge young adult section in the library or the bookstore. And I was in a very small town that had a really bad library. <laughs> I would have loved to have had a Kindle device or internet or something like that when I was a kid. But my son, it's like kids now, they have no idea. Andrew has no idea how lucky he is to have all of that at his fingertips. But I was just a country girl growing up in a log cabin out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> no internet, no phones, no Kindles, none of that, you know, we had phones, but not cell phones. Um, so I would read the same books over and over again. And even just to get to the mall was like a 45 minute drive, 50 minute drive. So we just didn't go very often. It would be like back to school or every once in a while you would get to go to the mall. And my very first thing I would always do when we get to the mall was go to the bookstore. And my sister would go to the record store I would go to the bookstore and I would go straight to that little teeny tiny. It's like now if you go to Barnes and Noble, there's this huge like entire section of young adult novels. But back then it was like literally one tiny little shelf and it had things like, you know, Sweet Valley High books, which by the way, let me know in the comments if you ever read the Sweet Valley High books. They were so full of like drama and intrigue. Sweet Valley twins um, were the kind of, spinoff where they were younger. And I read all of those. And then the Sweet Valley High as the uh, twins when they were older. But I loved those books. <laughs> They're very simple plot lines, but they like no fantasy or anything. But I loved those books. And George was reading through a series or a list of some of the best selling series of all time. And did you know that the Sweet Valley High books are some of the very best selling series of all time? How crazy is that? Like millions and millions of books. It just, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. But um, anyway, I loved those books, but they had like Sweet Valley High and then they had like the middle grade books. There were more middle grade books like Babysitter's Club and, um, you know, Ramona Beasley and whatever, Ramona Wimbley. No, I forget. But anyway, like more little kid books, but there was just like a couple shelves like Lois Lowry and Christopher Pike. And I loved horror, fantasy, mystery. And most of what Christopher Pike wrote was standalone books that had twists and turns in them. And that is when I really started to fall in love with this idea. Not all of his books were fantasy, but he did have some that were like paranormal or ghost or aliens. Like he went kind of all over the place. He also wrote a famous book called Chain Letter, which, you know, many of you probably recognize at least that premise. Um, so I loved those books. I know a lot of people will kind of uh, will kind of link him together with, so I saw LA put it, the Goosebumps and R.L. Stein. But I always feel like Goosebumps and R.L. Stein is more middle grade or little kid type books, like maybe an eight to 10 to 12 year old kid books. Whereas Christopher Pike was for teenagers. You know, there was some sexual situations. There were some bad language. It was just a, a little bit more mature than the Goosebumps books. And the Goosebumps books didn't start coming out until after I was past that sort of middle grade time. So I was never really into those books, but I loved, loved, loved Christopher Pike. I saw uh, Michelle mention Little House on the Prairie. I also had Little House. Obviously those books are older. I had all the Little, ho uh, all the little House on the Prairie 
books and read those multiple times. Like anything I got my hands on because I lived so country, I read, you know, 50,000 times. Um, so I read those books and I read um, the uh, Anne of Green Gables series and all of the spinoff things from that. And I loved that stuff. LJ Smith. Yes. Yeah, so that I think LJ Smith was a little bit after me. Um, like you're probably younger than I am because LJ Smith is the vampire diary stuff, right? Is that right? And I did not read those, but I think those came out maybe when I was more in college. I don't know for sure. Um, so series of unfortunate events is not something I ever read, but I think they, they're older books as well. Um, I read so many sweet Valley books too. I also read a bunch of books that were, um, I don't know if any of you guys read these. They were called Sweet Dreams books and they were contemporary romances, really short books. Like I, I don't even have anything here that I could show, but I mean, they were short books, but they were numbered and they were all written by different authors, but they always had like a girl on the front of them, but they were kind of like romances. And I always loved those books as well. So my like favorite things were those sort of like contemporary sweet romances, the horror type twisty turny mystery novels of Christopher Pike. But then I also loved the books that were um, like, tw like, I don't know, two weeks to die or a summer to live or summer to die, like books where it was like, the girl is a dancer, but she gets diabetes and then they tell her she can't dance anymore. Like just like, oh, or she's like a famous track star and she goes blind. And I would just love those kind of books because they made me cry. A Summer to Die was probably one of my favorite books of all time growing up. Um, again, when I was in that sort of preteen time. So those are just some of my favorite books. But Christopher Pike, you will definitely see some Lois Lowry and Christopher Pike influences in the types of books I like to write because I grew up absolutely loving those kinds of books. Now, when I go back and read some of my old Christopher Pike books that I loved so much, like Remember Me or um, Slumber Party, things like that, <laughs> they're so... Um, simple, I guess, like the plot lines as a writer looking back on it, I'm like, gosh, these books were like a lot more simple plot wise than I remember them being, but I still just love them as much as ever. So um, Christopher Pike is a pretty, I would call him maybe a reclusive writer. He is not super uh, social and active. Like you don't really see a lot of pictures of Christopher Pike and stuff like that. But he does have an admin on his Facebook page that is pretty active and nice. Um, but I think uh, you, I think he's still writing and stuff, but I think he kind of had his heyday back in the day. And I haven't read a lot of his newer stuff like Witch World and things like that. So anyway, a little bit of that. Um, <laughs> but oh, Kelly says, I don't like scary movies now. I still love scary movies and games. And I actually just, I got a, um, a Nintendo Switch from George for Christmas, which I love. And I just went today by the GameStop and picked up a case for my Switch. And I picked up a couple games. Did you know they have a Hello Kitty racing game? I had to grab it, it was used. And then I also got a, um, a triple like a three pack of Resident Evil games so I'm pretty excited to play those I've already played Resident Evil 6 so I'll just replay it on the switch but it's kind of fun hi Kelly's Kelly's creative dreams hello hello all right so I am gonna leave the rest of the questions for later and we're gonna dive into some tarot talk so I have some stuff here that I pulled up in a slide so what we're going to do is we're going to just kind of talk about there's, I mean, we could talk about tarot stuff forever. There is so much to cover when it comes to tarot, which is part of why I think that it can feel overwhelming sometimes. But from my point of view, here are some of the basics that will help you the most when you're just starting to learn about tarot cards. So tarot basics. First of all, there are 78 cards. So you have 78 cards total in a deck. There are 22 cards that are called the Major Arcana. And these are the cards that you're probably familiar with that are like famous in movies like the Death Card or uh, the Devil Card, things like that. So you, it's kind of the named cards, the Empress, the Emperor, the High Priestess, the Magician. And then you also have 56 Minor Arcana cards. 
So um, the, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how those all break down in just a second. But here are some of the tips that I have for, um, for the basics for Tara. Lois Duncan, yes, I kept saying Lois Lowry, which I also like Lois Lowry, but I meant Lois Duncan because of the like, uh, gosh, what was that book where it's like they kill their teacher? Oh, no, I can't remember. But I loved Lois Duncan haunted house kind of stories and accidentally kill your teacher kind of stories. Um, oh gosh, there were a couple of those stories that I really liked too. Very similar to Christopher Pike, but anyway, sorry. Um, so with tarot decks, one of the biggest tips that I can have for you in terms of where do you start? So the one of the basic decks that people know is called the Rider Weight Tarot. It is kind of the traditional pictures and images, but you don't have to start with that. If you go and you look like you could search for tarot decks, like if you hear about them or somebody mentions them, you could go and you could look online. And most of these places you'll be able to find like in a Google search, what is the Rider Waite tarot deck look like? And you'll get a good idea of the basic design and style of the cards. Find a deck that you like. So if that if you read that or you go and look at those images or you're at a bookstore or you're on Amazon and you search for tarot cards and you don't like the way that writer weight deck looks and you don't feel like it's speaking to you, you don't have to start with that. You don't have to start with any kind of tarot deck. But my biggest tip when it comes to do you like this one or not, it is really try to pick one that has images that kind of tell a story. Because if you pick one, like I, I use this as an example, I really love the Kawaii tarot deck. It's really, really cute. It has little like candy canes and like popsicle looking things. And it's super cute. But the four of wands and the six of wands have nothing different other than this one has six lollipops and this one has four. So when you go to try to intuitively tell the difference between the four and the six of wands, you're like, I don't know, it's just all cute lollipops. Like there's nothing that would not be a good deck for beginners, I would say. It's very simple, but there's no story to tell. There's no people on them. There's no killing Mr. Griffin. Thank you very much, Jen. <laughs> I'm going to go back and forth. Um, but when you start, I would recommend that you start just to show with a deck that has like people that invoke some kind of emotion or uh, something that you can look at and kind of analyze it. Like, how does this react or respond to the question that I asked? Um, but like you can see here, she's got a string that she's holding that goes up to the star. She's looking up wistfully. The colors tell a story. There's all kinds of things here that can tell, you know, you can tell from the images themselves. So King of Wands here, like you can tell that he is strong. He's got his, you know, he's standing confidently. He's got his hand casually in his pocket, but he's holding fire. He's got the lion behind him. So this is someone who is strength, strong. They know what they want. That determined look on his face can tell you a little bit more about how that would answer your question. And that's going to be so much more useful to you as you're starting to learn the cards than having a deck that just has pictures on it that are just like, that don't tell any kind of story to it. So I would just recommend finding a deck that has some kind of story or something that you would really like to, um, explore more of. So as somebody, somebody mentioned, Cheryl mentioned the everyday witch tarot. That is a really good one. If you like witchy stuff, which I'm assuming you do, cause you like my books, <laughs> um, then you would like the everyday witch tarot. Those have people, they have, uh, both men and women and sort of more androgynous figures that is just like really, really good storytelling on the card. So when you look, you say, you can say like, oh, I think this could mean this without even ha having to look up the meaning of it. Like you don't necessarily want to have to be in the deck every time going, okay, what does this mean? Sometimes you want to just intuitively be, be like, oh, this means that I'm strong or, you know, whatever. So this particular deck is called the Lightseer's Tarot. This is a new deck to me. 
it's not a new deck in the world, but it's a new deck to me. And it is one of my new favorite decks. I absolutely am loving it. It's more sort of colorful, multicultural. It has definitely has stories to be told. I think it was $20 or so on Amazon. So it's called the Light Seers Tarot. It's beautiful. I really love it. The Everyday Witch Tarot is another really good one. If you like the idea of the um, original, like you kind of want to go back to basics and start to learn with something that is more like the Rider Waite traditional tarot. Whereas these are obviously kind of like more modern images. He's wearing jeans, you know, stuff like that, <laughs> that you, you know, you, you want to go with more traditional you can go with the Rider Weight deck, but another one that you might enjoy that I really love is called the Golden Universal Tarot. And that one has a lot of the same images from the Rider Weight deck, but it's gold foiled. And some of the images are shifted slightly, just like slightly design changed. I really love that one. But just go with something that you connect with or that you like looking at. If it's something that you're like, well, I got one that has all these cats on it. I saw some people mentioning cats or mystical cat tarot and stuff like that. But you are not a cat person. Maybe you're not going to enjoy that deck as much. So really try to come up with a deck that you'll like. But if you just don't even know where to start, try something like this one, the Lightseer's Tarot, the Everyday Witch Tarot, or the Golden Universal Tarot. Tarot cards on Amazon, you can get anywhere from about $15 to $30. And then, of course, you can find much more expensive decks, like my True Black deck, I think, was $75 that has hand-painted elements on it. So you can go, you know, far into the expensive, or you can actually get some things that are a lot less expensive. But $20, I think, is reasonable for something that you could use every single day. If you really want to learn tarot, I recommend as a tip that you develop a tarot routine. So that means like not just every, you know, once in a blue moon, you're like, oh, yeah, I have these tarot cards and you pull them out and you're like, oh, I'm going to read them a little bit. And you do these elaborate spreads and then you put them away and they gather dust for another year. If you really want to learn tarot, come up with a tarot routine for yourself. So like start a journal or just a basic notebook and you just draw one card every night before bed or one card every day when you wake up. And it won't be like you're learning the whole deck all at once. You'll be just gradually getting to know the cards and you'll find that like, oh, I just picked up the star again. Okay. I've seen that card several times recently. And now you start to remember just by repetition what that card means. And maybe you look it up and maybe you just study it and you say, oh, I never noticed the way that she's looking up to the sky. And that means that she's like hopeful about the future or whatever it is. But the more you get to know those cards, the better off you're going to be in terms of learning them over time. So I started out drawing three cards a day. Um, well, actually, when I first started out, I was doing what I was saying is I had a deck of cards and I was interested in them, but I would just pull them out every once in a blue moon and I would do a Celtic cross spread and read them. And I would spend my whole time with my nose in the book trying to figure out what everything means. And then I wouldn't touch them again for three or four months. And when I started every single day drawing three cards, I didn't give them any specific meaning. Like you could draw three cards and have it be past, present, future, or yes, no, maybe, or, you know, whatever. But I just said, I'm going to draw three cards. And I didn't ask anything in terms of a specific question. I would just say, what do I need to know or see in my life right now? Very open-ended, just what, what message do you have for me tonight? And I would shuffle the cards up and I would pick three cards and I would just see if I could figure out what they mean without looking at the deck and then, or without looking at the book or any type of website. And I would just go off the images. And the more I would intuitively check or use my intuition to try to figure out what it meant, the more comfortable I got at deciding and remembering what those cards meant, because you'll get visual cues that you'll be like, Oh, in this one um, you have 
the girl all alone at the top of the stairs, you know, that kind of thing. And you'll be like, I know you can't see that super well, but you'll, you'll just constantly remember, oh, the mountains in the distance. And this is the hermit card. And this is what it means that you need some alone time and you need some peace and quiet for yourself. And so you'll start to see those images over and over again. So I recommend finding to start with one deck that you connect with or that you like the images that tell some kind of story or have people or images that you like on them. And then develop a tarot routine as simple as just, I'm going to draw one card every night before bed. And this is going to be my new habit. And I'm just going to have fun with it. Another tip is, like I said, to use your intuition. So instead of drawing a card and immediately Googling, what does the queen of wands mean? Really look at the imagery and say, what's going on in this picture? What do I really see happening? What, what are the people, are there people interacting here? Is it just a woman? What does she look like? What's the expression on her face? What is she holding? What's other symbols or whatever like landscape is she in? And really take a look at what, you, what emotion that evokes in you, because there are sort of universally accepted meanings for tarot cards but there also is your own intuition and your own personal relationship with the cards. And really one of the most powerful things that tarot can do for you is like a lot of people think, oh, it predicts the future, but it's not so much about predicting the future, although that can be part of it. It's also about drawing out your own intuition about what is going on. It helps you see some things that you might be hiding from yourself in terms of, you know, what, um, what have you been ignoring in your life? What do you know, but you just need confirmation on like that star card? Like, am I going to be famous someday? You pull the star and you're like, yes, okay. I knew deep down in my heart, this was going to be the way for me or, you know, whatever it is, but you can pull on your own intuition. And so Vanessa said, so tarot is about trusting your gut. It is so much about trusting your gut and your own intuition. And like I said, you may, there may be official definitions for the cards, but every site that you go to, every book that you read that comes with it, most tarot decks will come with a little booklet um, that explains what the cards mean. But there will also be your own personal inspiration inspiration, intuition, and experience with the cards. And um, so I like to keep a tarot journal to keep my own personal notes about, man, this card keeps coming up. Like, for example, just to give you an example of, um, of tarot meaning something different to you than it does necessarily on paper. So there's a card called the Hierophant. And this is traditionally a card that's more about like religious institutions or, or teachers or um, like mentors and that kind of thing. But for me, the Hierophant card always speaks to me as a teacher, like my personal journey as a teacher or a leader in my community. That is not necessarily what that card means for everyone. For some people, that card might mean more about their religion or their um, like boss or <laughs> their mentors or something like that. But a lot of times when I get the Hierophant card, that specifically means to me something, it will have some kind of message within the reading about my teaching for other people and my leadership on YouTube or teaching and coaching people. And so that's like a personal, um, personal relationship with the card. Um, so yeah, use your own intuition and pay attention to when it constantly or consistently comes up for you as a personal card or personal reading. So I did see that some people were asking, can tarot cards tell you something bad is coming? So tarot cards can tell you that you might, the struggle might continue. It can also pull out your own fears. Like I said, it can, you know, it's based in your own intuition for sure. But like I saw Christabel said, like you, once you get to know the meanings of the cards, you'll see it on TV, which is where it's kind of gotten that sort of reputation. That if you pull the death card, it means you're going to die, dun, 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 you know, but that's not at all what death means. The death card is more about 
Like <laughs> um, my tarot coach, Tanya Gonzalez, sang this to me one time when we were in our tarot lessons, that Justin Timberlake song where he's like, the old me's dead and gone, dead and gone, you know? And I always think of that song when I hear it, I think of her and the death card is kind of like that, um, that transition, death and rebirth of you know, there's a piece of you that you need to let go of. You maybe have limiting beliefs that you need to let go of, or this is, it's actually can be a very, very positive card. So you don't just look at the death card and be like, ah, death, you know, we're, I'm going to die. Um, but there are cards that have sometimes negative associations with them. Like the three of swords can often mean betrayal or loss. And so you have to look at it in the context of what you were asking, but it doesn't always mean like face value, like someone is going to stab you in the back. That doesn't necessarily mean what it, you know, isn't what it means. So you have to really think of it more intuitively um, and more, I don't know the right word for it exactly, but like she said, not so face value. And yeah, it could be the death of something that's holding you back. It could just be the it could also mean like a door is closing in your life. Like maybe you're going to lose your job or you're ready to leave your job, but that something better is coming for you. So it, it can mean a lot of those things. So <laughs> hangman a lot. Yeah, it could be that too. Um, so hangman is, uh, you'll see the hangman is like someone who is kind of hanging upside down. And that often means that you need a change in perspective or you need to see things from other people's points of view or, you know, in all of these cards, it's not like the death card means that you're going to lose something or every card is, has like a multitude of meanings. There is no like one definition. This card means this one sentence. It's like every card can mean a lot of different things. So since we're on that subject, I will just briefly also talk about the fact that, um, so here's the devil card, which the devil card does not mean, um, that something bad is going to happen to you either. But the devil card often means that it's it's usually all about temptation, that you're going to be tempted by things that may not be so good for you. Um, but a lot of people will read the cards, all of them, they'll just read them one way. Sometimes when people read the cards, they will also pay attention to how they pull them out of, out of the deck. So if you were to pull it out of the deck and it was upside down, some people would read it as the devil reversed. So in that case, you would kind of have two separate meanings for each card. There is no real right or wrong way. There's just personal theories as to whether you should do a reversed reading or not and pay attention. Um, my, my tarot teacher, she doesn't do that. She does not. Yeah, all of these are from the Lightseers Tarot. She does not read a card reversed. It's just, these are the cards and you have to read them in context and she uses her intuition. So she doesn't say, oh, you got the devil reversed. She just turns it back upright. So there's no right or wrong when it comes to that. But if you're interested in doing reverse readings, I would start with just regular getting to know the cards at, you know, as they are. And then if you want to go deeper, you can go into the reverse meanings and the reversed meanings don't always mean the opposite. It means often more internal. So the regular upright meaning might mean something more external of what's going on in your outer or how outside influences are affecting you and so on. Whereas the reversed meanings can sometimes be something more that you need to learn on a very personal, internal, emotional level, but that's not always the case either. So it just kind of depends on how you want to read them. But that I would say would be much more advanced tarot reading. So if that makes you feel overwhelmed, like, oh, I, I got to learn 78 cards plus upside down. Don't just don't start that way. Just just keep them all like like this, use your intuition, pay attention to the images, and then use tools like the book that your cards came with, or one like you can Google Biddy Tarot, B I D D Y Tarot.com is uh, probably one of the most um, popular 
Uh, but there are lots and lots of them <laughs> where if you look up tarot meanings on Google, you will find websites and websites and websites dedicated to exploring the meaning of tarot. You can also grab books from Barnes and Noble or Amazon that talk about meaning of tarot and you can use them as reference. So just, oh no, it's out of stock. <laughs> yeah, probably because everybody is loving this deck right now. I've seen so many people grabbing it. Um, so that is just kind of some of my biggest tips about it. Some more basics. The major arcana follows the fool's journey. So the major arcana go from card zero, they're all numbered, card zero all the way up to card 21. So there's 22 cards, but the fool is like the zero card. And you basically, you could study the fool's journey, because the fool is that first zero card, all the way from the fool to the world. And the world card or the universe card, as some people would call it, is that final completion. So you've got the completion of the cycle and then it starts all over again. So if you wanted to get really interested and you wanted to learn a lot about tarot, then you can definitely follow the cards in order and what they mean and kind of taking them. So another thing if you really wanted to study is not just coming up with a single card read every single night or something like that, but you could also take those first 22 cards of the major arcana and just study them one at a time. So like this week, you're going to learn a little bit about the full, take five or 10 minutes and sort of read about what does the fool mean? This is the beginning of the journey. It's like someone who's naive and hopeful and excited. A lot of times the fool will be a card where it's sort of someone who's like looking up and they're taking a leap and they're about to fall off a cliff. But it just means it doesn't mean they're going to die. It just means they're unaware, blissfully unaware to the challenges or dangers ahead of them. So it can often be kind of like a childlike thing. Um, so it's it's I think it's really interesting to read a little bit about each of the major arcana cards in order and how it follows the fool's journey, just kind of an interesting thing. But the major arcana are considered those like big, powerful cards, the fool, the magician, the empress, the emperor, the high priestess, justice, judgment, death, you know, you've got all these cards that are um, kind of the, they're the, the trump cards, the big cards of the deck. Then you have the minor arcana, which if you've ever played just playing cards, you will get to know, you, you'll recognize how the minor arcana is structured because it's split into four suits similar to regular playing cards. And we're going to talk about those a little bit too. So each suit goes from ace, which is the one card, to 10. So you just have like the ace of wands, the two of wands, the three of wands and so forth. And then after you get to 10, you have the four car court cards and each deck can be different in what they call these things. Like the different suits might have different names and the court cards might be a little bit different. So sometimes you'll see page, sometimes you'll see princess, um, sometimes you'll see daughter here. So it just, or there's one that I have that's like, the crone and the whatever it's like they so each deck might have its own sort of personality to it in terms of what it calls these things but traditionally you've got the page the knight the queen and the king so the king would be kind of like the highest of the court cards all right so a little bit of a key that kind of can get you to remember the four suits so each of them follows one of the four elements that we're familiar with, earth, air, fire, and water. So the pentacles can often be called coins, discs, stones, or in playing cards, diamonds. This represents earth or some of the other keywords you might represent with this are often these cards when you pull them are talking about your like material possessions, your career or your job, your income and your money, um, your house, your home, your uh, business. It can also mean like because it's earth, it can also actually physically mean your garden and things like that. But it can often it often refers to like the physical realm of your life and your things and your job. The swords, which some people would know as spades, it doesn't have as many as, as far as I've seen uh, various um, things that it's known as. I think I did have one that it was like, um, 
somebody called it something different. Now I can't remember. Um, but for the most part, you'll see swords as swords. And this is the air element. And this is all about like intellect, logic, communication, your thoughts, um, critical thinking, the truth of the matter, um, your mind, the cerebral side of things, your judgment, your facts and figures and that kind of thing. Um, swords to me is always one of the more, always tends to be one of the more negative. <laughs> and I wonder if that's because I've, I'm always more about like cups or fire, you know, that kind of thing. But like swords to me kind of has a more negative feel to things. Um, and I think I just need more work with swords, but so a lot of the swords are more, challenging in terms of bad news, I feel like sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, more logic, intellect, and that kind of thing. Communication. Wands can also be known as batons or staves, rods. I see rods a lot, like the five of rods instead of wands. Clubs, staffs, or scepters, you'll see all of those kinds of things. So clubs would be what it is in the playing card deck. And this is fire. And this has more to do often with your spirituality, your passion, how much energy you have, your true creativity or your fire. It can be about your anger, your temper. It can be some of the cards can be talking about competition with other people or sexuality, your motivation and that kind of thing. So um, a little bit of keywords that you might see attached, like when you ask a question and it gives you a, a wands answer, it might be talking more about your inner spirituality or your passion and your fire for life. Cups is water. So chalices, grails, cauldron, hearts, or vessels, you might hear them called in other decks. And this is um, things like your emotions and your um, feelings, your relationships. So think about water and flow. And, you know, it really just once you get to know these cards, you will see that element in them. Earth is like earthy possessions, your material things air and swords is like slicing through the, you know, the cut of the tongue, the logic, you know, there's a lot of, as writers, some of us and readers, you'll start to understand those um, correlations, like um, between a sword, the sword pen is mightier than the sword and that kind of stuff. Like you'll see that in lots of um, references, wands being like your passion. And it's got that fire. Like often you'll see the wands will have like a torch or some kind of fire on them. And that's your passion, your creativity, your anger, your sexuality. And then cups is that water, like flow, emotions, your inner intuition, your sensitivity, your like, if you ask a question about your love life, sometimes the cups will be a big theme there or your psychic ability or your subconscious. So this is kind of a key if you're just getting to know the cards to kind of remember those four elements and that can really help you. In terms of numbers, I know this is stuff that you guys probably won't retain because it's a lot of information, but, and this is definitely not set in stone. Like every time you get a three, it means this, but the numbers, like there is numerology in tarot and the numbers do tend to kind of group together. So even though it's the four of swords and pentacles and cups, they all do kind of share some common elements about what they're supposed to teach you or where they kind of are in the journey. So it follows like aces or the one card of each suit is usually about new beginnings and opportunities. If it's new beginnings and it's the ace of pentacles, it's going to be a new beginning with moving to a new house or the potential for a new job or a new career or new money, like a lot of money coming in out of nowhere. But if it's the Ace of Cups, it might be something like your intuition is flowing or you're having, maybe it can mean pregnancy, like a new, um, like new life springing forth, like water and flow, new ideas, things like that. Um, but if it's the ace of swords, then maybe it's new ways of communicating with people like, oh, maybe I am going to start a YouTube channel, or maybe I'm going to finish that book, or I'm going to get a new idea for my new novel. And so you'll see how even though it's all aces, it can play into which ones, um, like, you've got the number as one level, and then you have the suit as a second level. So it's kind of interesting to think about that. We won't go into those in detail, but just know that if you're interested in this, you can go just Google like 
numbers in tarot and you'll find it like tarotelements.com or biddytarot.com. You'll see some of these things. I pulled this directly from biddytarot.com and I meant to put it actually on the slide and forgot, but I will just add her website to the chat. But she lists these on her website in when you're learning the cards. The same thing is true. I don't include it here in this little presentation, but the same thing is true for, um, for the court cards. So like the pages are also usually about like openings and beginnings. And then the nights are more about your start. It sort of follows that same similar type of journey. So you've got the pages are kind of the beginning, the potential of something, but it's not necessarily the follow through. But then the night is more about the hard work or the follow through. And then you've got the queen coming into her own. And then the king is kind of the culmination of that cycle of like the confidence and more masculine energy of it. So you've got, um, you know, multiple sides. And a lot of times you will see that sort of masculine versus feminine energy, not meaning man and woman, but just like um, the masculine versus feminine, which we all have both. So it's just a really interesting thing to go down. And the more you get interested in the numbers, the relationships between the cards, um, and you start to understand that like, oh, the pages kind of all mean the same thing. But then you go back to this list over here and you say, okay, the page of pentacles is going to be about these kinds of things, whereas the page of swords will be like these. Then you add the extra element of um, like adding the actual picture as well. So I'm trying to find a good one, like a good example. So if you talk about and you look at four being structure and stability and manifestation, and then you add on top of it, this idea of the four of pentacles, which we know is about money. She actually has a coin purse here on her and she's clutching it like she's afraid she's going to lose it. She's turned away from it. She's not necessarily looking confident. She's like, afraid of it maybe. So then you can take this thing of like this idea of stability and manifestation and you can say, okay, maybe the four of pentacles here is about her being afraid that she's not going to have enough money or that she's hoarding it, that she's clutching it and holding on to it and being like, this is mine and I'm not going to share it with anyone. So you can start to understand those meanings without actually looking up what it means in a book. Um, and, you know, maybe when you go to look at it, you're going to be like, oh, well, that's not actually what it means at all. <laughs> and then you'll learn. And then next time you see that card, you'll remember and you'll start to develop those associations. Um, so this particular card is um, on this uh, deck. It says there it does have calls it light seer, which would be the upright version of it. And shadow seer is kind of the reverse. So for light seer, it says stability. Remember how I said the fours are about stability. So it's saying stability and savings, success and generosity. But the shadow side of that is hoarding or coveting or feeling like you don't have enough, placing too much value on your money. And then it also has in this particular deck, this book has a little uh, affirmation for you. I live an abundant life and I have more than I need. So depending on where you are in your life, this card might bring up feelings of, oh, I finally have enough in savings and I'm not having to worry about where our next meal is coming from. For other people, where you are in your life, you might be thinking, why do I never feel like I have enough? Or why do I feel like... Um, I can't ever work hard enough to, you know, make enough money or I can't hold on to my money and I never feel stable when it comes to my job or whatever. So it can have multiple meanings depending on where you are in your life and what your personal situations are. So all of that stuff can be, I think, really interesting to study and look into. So hopefully you guys got something out of that in terms of just basics of tarot. There are also, there are so many more things we could talk about, like specific readings. Like you've probably seen people um, like talking through the Celtic cross, which is a specific formulation in each point of the tarot card where it goes in the Celtic cross 
is potentially, um, you know, a different meaning. So this card might represent where you are, whereas this card represents what's going wrong in your life. And this card represents your subconscious versus this card represents where your life is headed in the near future. So each card has a meaning. You can also just do your own. So go very intuitively and say, I'm just going to draw three cards. And one is going to mean yesterday, today, and tomorrow, like past, present, future. But you can come up with your own meanings and you can come up with your own spreads. If you're interested in seeing different spreads, like when we get to the new moon here coming up or whatever, you could go in and you could say, um, just Google new moon tarot readings for manifestation and find, you know, dozens of them on Pinterest or online and just, just follow them. And they'll maybe be four cards or it might be like, I don't know, like 10 cards, but you can go and check them and just play around with it and have fun with it. And if you want to really go deeper in your tarot journey, journal, journey, keep a journal because that will help you. I think um, Rachel said she looks contented. So for Rachel, this is what I'm talking about with intuition. For Rachel, she might think, oh, she looks like she's at peace and she has plenty because she's holding on to it. But somebody else who's in a different state might see this differently. They might see that she's afraid and that's why she's looking away. She doesn't want to face what's really happening in her bank account, you know? So it could mean different things to different people and both of you would be right. So it's fully about what you see in the cards and where you are in what you asked. So I think that that is a really fun way to look at tarot. And if you just want to get started simply, I recommend picking up the Rider Waite or the Golden Universal Tarot and just drawing one card a day and seeing what it feels like to you. But it's it's a really fun and fulfilling way to pull out your own intuition and what you feel about your life and what's going on in your life. So I highly recommend it. I'm sorry that the lighting is so dark here, but it's been so rainy <laughs> that I'm just working off this one light. Um, we do have a couple other questions. So I am just going to read through them. But if anybody has, we only have like five more minutes, but if anybody has any more questions that you guys wanna put in the chat, um, somebody asked, Leah asked, do you journal your writing process as you work on a novel? So I do sometimes and sometimes I don't. So I always journal my thoughts on the book itself and, um, like, well, what if they do this, like playing through different um, scenarios and different things like that? I will do that sometimes. Um, but journaling about my process, like, oh, today I had trouble with this, um, or it took me longer than I expected. And like my own experience, I haven't been doing that. But I have just recently set up a, a writing journal in Notion. And I'm going to be doing a video on this as I get more um, more of it set up over on my heart breathings channel. And I think it's going to be really good. So in that journal, I'm actually journaling about the process, about how long I spent today, how it went so that I can really analyze my own process and see where I could speed things up or where I'm getting into trouble and stuff like that. So sort of yes and no. Um, Grace says, I know you've discussed this on your heart breathings channel, but how are you able to stick with writing the same series to finish it without burning out and having your muse want to move on with another series? So this is tough because obviously I have not done a great job of that. It's like once I got to book six of the demon series, I needed to do something different. So I started a couple other things and it took me years and years to finish that. And then maybe I moved on to, um, you know, something like, uh, the Sacrifice Me series, which was a spinoff. And then here we were in 2016 or whatever, I had five series going. And it can be really hard to not jump around to different things because so many of us have like thousands of ideas that we want to write. And it can just be hard to stick with one, which is why writing a really long series is not for everyone, because for some people, you just can't stick to it. Um, but I think that one of the things that helps me with, obviously I'm writing all things that I love. So if you start out writing something that you just are trying to write to make a lot of money and you don't really love the story, it's going to be extremely hard to stick to it. Number two, I do try to keep talking through the ideas with my husband and just talking through it is really helpful to get my attention back on it. Um, talking through it with fans too, of like, 
seeing how excited you guys are for the witch's door makes me excited to work on it. Um, and also just like never compromising your story because you think you're going to make more money or you're going to be more successful if you write it a different way, because there's nothing that can kill your creativity or your joy of writing faster than, oh, let me write this thing I don't like. <laughs> like, uh, I didn't want to make this romance, but now I'm going to make it romance because I think it'll sell better. Or I didn't want to put all this like bad language in here or sex in here, but everybody tells me I have to. Um, so compromising who you are as a writer is not going to help you. So if you're planning to write a long series, just stay true to yourself. And I know that can sound easier said than done if you're not making the money you wanted to make, but it's just so much better in my opinion, to really follow your own heart uh, when it comes to your writing and you will be happier writing things long-term in that way. Um, so we do have a couple other questions that I'm not going to totally get to like marketing techniques. I can talk about that next week. Megan, I know you have asked me many times if I would uh, consider publishing other authors and my answer is still kind of just the same that I am not at this time planning to publish anyone else. Um, I just really are, I'm just really not interested in going to, to be a publisher. I feel like I already run kind of four businesses on my own. Um, and I just can't handle that as well, but maybe it would be on the table years from now. Um, but for now, not really. Um, so, uh, I saw that, um, Hichigo had asked where are these cards sold. I don't know if anybody answered, but I got mine from Amazon. Um, so let's see. Da, da, da. I did see um, Christabel had said that you somebody told her you shouldn't do readings on yourself, which is just not true. Um, maybe someone's personal belief, but definitely not. There's nothing wrong about it. And yes, Andrew got a haircut. We went in last weekend. Little Evie's wearing a new dress from Zara. That looks so cute. You want to say hi? Say hi. Hi, guys. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So kind of four businesses in a way. So I have personal private coaching. I have two YouTube channels. I write, I have a planner business on Etsy. Um, I teach courses. So it's just, I have a lot of different income streams and businesses that I run. So it's like to start publishing other people and marketing their books too, is just too much. So we, we have, I think we have enough. Um, but maybe someday in the future, we'll see. Um, but for now, I'm handling about as much as I think I can handle. Maybe when these little ones are a little bit bigger. Um, so uh, Cheryl says, you can also go to a meta metaphysical shop for tarot cards, which is so true. But uh, it depends on where you live and where whether or not you have any near you. Even here in Charleston, I don't have any close to me here in West Ashley. Um, her hair is getting a lot thicker. Google. Are you trying to talk to Google? She's talking so much more and she's like running and everything. I don't, I don't think uh, Iron Giant. George, what's your shirt? It's Attack on Titan. I didn't see what he was wearing today. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's just thicker. It's just continues to get thicker. She's getting her, she's got four molars now. It's just crazy. Um, so I didn't get to every question, but we did get to many of them, which is really fun. I hope that you guys enjoyed this kind of basics of tarot. We can keep the conversation going if you guys enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed talking about it. Um, also, uh, next Friday is the release date for Fate Surrender. It is not up. Again, the Amazon pre-order got canceled, so it is not up on Amazon yet, but it go. will go up on Amazon most likely on Thursday because I am going to upload it a little bit earlier. Um, but I will also have, you know, the pre-order is still up everywhere else that you can go ahead and pre-order if you'd like. If you have have not started this series death's awakening book one is free and book two is already available book three is oh. book three will go up on friday i hope that you guys love it it's going to be really good i do not know for sure when the fourth book will come out so we'll talk a little bit more about what i'm calling my game board strategy on um, maybe next friday and then hopefully next friday i will also have an announcement for you guys of when exactly we are starting the witch's door readings which will be coming up soon um i saw amanda asked is there anywhere cheaper to get your books in australia and sadly there's not right now i only have them 
available at Barnes and Noble, which is US only and Amazon. And I don't think that Amazon has printing in Australia yet. So I, I don't think that there is. All I can tell you is when the Shadow Demon series is over, I am hoping to put the entire series up for sale on like through me and I will personally ship them out. Now, it's still going to be expensive uh, to ship, but it should be less expensive than Amazon. <laughs> um, so we'll see how it goes. I, I would love to get into maybe some more international bookshops, but I right now I think I would have to go through Ingham Spark to do that. And I have not had that on my plate, but I will definitely take into consideration that several of you who are not here in the U S that ha you know don't have such easy access to the books at Amazon, I will definitely keep you in mind as I make further plans to, to move in there. So um, we will keep working on it and I will let you know when those are available. Um, and I think that's it, you guys. <laughs> you can see Evie's playing around with my new wall calendar. So I'll be covering that on my Heart Breathings channel coming up. But I love you guys so much. Thank you for being here for another fun Friday coffee chat with over 100 people. I have loved that we've had such a great crowd for these. Um, and I am, nope, don't press that. Just trying to make my standing desk go higher. Um, but I will see you guys next Friday for a release party for Fate Surrender. After all this time, I can't believe it's really coming out. And um, yeah, then we'll talk schedule for The Witch's Door. So I will see you there Bye. for sure. So um, I love you guys and we will talk soon. Bye.